Let's talk about all of this from a learning and development perspective and how learning and development professionals can anticipate some of these trends when they're setting up infrastructure and learning programs. Yep. Uh, so, for example, we used to do team building by getting the team in the room, right? Spending a half day, maybe doing some assessment, giving some feedback, facilitating a uh, communication amongst the team members. Well, now those team members are virtual. They're in four different time zones. And uh, how do you develop a, uh, a team when they're virtual? So this learning develop, let's say, leadership development skills that we are taking on are more about how to help people do virtually, both as teams and as, and as individuals and as communities, really, uh, uh, the whole organization. And so the way in which people learn virtually it's not so different than the way they learn if, if we can all sit together in a room. Uh, you know, we're communicating relatively similar here, even though I'm virtual and you all are in the same room. Well, we're, we're doing okay getting our communications across. When everybody's virtual, it's still an environment in which humans are involved and you have to engage them, you have to meet their needs. You have to speak in a way that they're interested in listening and learning. What's different about it is uh, you don't have them trapped in the same room. <laughs> so you have to be better at engaging them. You have to be quicker and sharper on what you're delivering and shorter and sweeter on what you're asking back. So uh, I don't know if that goes directly at your question, Vaishali, but uh, that's the experience we're having now. And, developing our people virtually. I definitely um, definitely can concur with that, Robert. And I'd say that, um, you know, what we found at mass and scale and, and in all kinds of different audiences, you know, technical audiences, non-technical audiences, is that the whole idea of learning is so much different than it was before. You know, on the one hand, some of it's the same. So you still, people still need destinations to work towards. Right? They still need the paths. They still need to understand where they need to go. And we find actually that there's so much confusion out there in the workforce about what it is they need to know to get their job done. Um, that that's the first thing we can do as leaders is give them clarity in what you want them to learn and the kind of skills that are important to you and your organization. First thing you got to do is give them clarity on that. And we do that by doing three to five year planning cycles on our talent and the workforce at large. And we plan literally the entire industry, not just us, but our entire industry. We have this thing called the talent uh, forecasting tools that l help us to understand if the industry is going to grow at this rate, we need the following people and we need them in these kind of specialties. So we literally take that information and we post that and we put that out there and we publish on that all the time so that both internally and externally, everyone that's involved in our community can map themselves towards that and think about their future. Then the second thing we do is we orient the topics and the tools and the technologies towards those things and we allow, allow them to organize. In fact, we ask them to organize in some of those various topics. And then the third thing is that while we do create um, education programs, you know, from the ground up from our side that are both video-based, searchable, immersive so it's not just about throwing a video up there if you think that you know creating a good training program is throwing anybody up in front of a camera and recording for an hour um, something forget it. it it doesn't work believe me you, you've seen a lot I'm sure, sure we've all seen those really really bad you know uh, YouTube examples but um, but education now actually takes in, in a lot of ways more skill and craft than ever before if you're going to do it well if you're going to do it right and if you're going to get an outcome at the end of the day so that means uh, being able to design it in a way that, yes, drives the interactions. you got to have them interacting with you every 10 minutes. If you don't, in a remote learning environment, have them literally engaging with that program every 10 minutes, you're going to lose them. Two, you have to think about it differently. You have to think about not just engaging them with questions, but making it fun and interesting. So you have to, in fact, when we, when we decided to go down this path 10 years ago, we actually hired people from Disney and from, you know, people that were actually in the entertainment business to come in and help us create really interesting, fun videos that would be engaging. We also thought about the fact that 
once we train them virtually, we want them to use, we want, don't want them to just be trained, we want them to have this information repository, right? They need to think about these, these learning assets as um, real information repositories where they can type in a question and get an answer from them, right? So they become this information base, not just, you know, a, a, a one-hour training module, because in our world, we have hold something like um, 20,000 different classes. You know, so we're kind of like a, a major university, and then we've got all kinds of different job roles we're trying to solve for, and um, and you know, people need to be able to find the right thing at the right place at the right time. You learn something one day, you walk away from it. If you don't use it immediately, you're gonna lose it. So, um, so the ability for us to create information assets out of learning that can be tapped in in a moment's notice, then, become, then you become really relevant. Then you move from training and learning to what I think of as knowledge services and, and knowledge and data. And that's where I think we all need to go is to make sure that our learning that we create is that relevant, that it becomes part of the information base that your employees can't live without. Um, and so that's what we've tried to create in all of our programs. And of course, the having it served up in a virtual space that's very easy to use, that doesn't turn anybody away. Most learning management systems, as you know, um, push people away instead of invite them in. So having really easy to use things that aggregate all of this and bring it all together in one place, instead of having 14 different tools that people have to go search and find their place on, that doesn't work, right? So aggregating it, making it available, usable, easy, and an, a long-term information tool that they can engage and work together and co-create together. That's our vision of what best-in-class learning is, and that's what we've, we've tried to bring to the market. So I'm not a learning mm -hmm. development professional, so I don't know how much I can add to the wonderful comments from my colleagues, but I just want to reflect on something about the organization having confusion, something Jean said. I think organizations have contradictions. And we do exactly to our employees what we do to our kids. We put them in a classroom, we teach them, we have a teacher, uh, and they come out and it's all gone. And, and, I, and then there's contradiction against basics of learning, curiosity, making mistakes, trial and errors, mm -hmm. innovation. I mean, organizations don't like innovative people. Innovative people are a pain in the neck. <laughs> no. I know, I'm one of them. No, <laughs> nobody likes innovative people. So you get them in this bubble and you teach them everything and you get them out. <clears throat> and the only reminder of the teaching is that poster that says, aim high. And it's right on the wall. And when you see those posters, you know that organization has no learning capabilities. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so how do we address the contradiction? Because it's the culture. that We don't have the culture of learning. You know, yeah. we we try, but we we don't really have it. We're risk averse, especially when you know you've got so many pressures on you in terms of delivery and and margins and and quarterly results. So I think it's it's really difficult. I, I don't have an answer to it, but I think it's not working. That's that's all I can tell you. It's not working unless the culture <coughs> changes. That's right. 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 And how do we change that culture to make sure the organization can? learn on itself and, and reflect. And we don't reflect, as an organization, we don't reflect. We make mistakes every day and we make the same mistakes the next day and we never reflect on it. Mm -hmm. So I, I really don't know. I'm hoping someone can tell me because I need to know and I need to figure out how do we get our organization learn and behave and, 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 and change. Thank you. Yeah, I agree with that. And, you know, can I, can I, yeah. yeah, could I give a quick response? Uh, great question, Eddie, and I appreciate your uh, challenge that uh, we don't have learning cultures. It's a fair, fair point. What I would, uh, I'll start with just one of my favorite quotes, which is, uh, if you don't know where you're going, you'll end up somewhere else. And I think each of us have said this in many different ways, that the common understanding of the goal needs to be clear for the data and the learning to be useful in terms of changing something out there in the world. Now, I think, Addie, what you're bringing up is knowing what that goal is also needs to be part of the conversation, even though that's complex. So, for example, uh, in the programs that we're working with currently in this uh, 
shared knowledge generating way, collaborative social online learning. We put the goal out and then we invite people to challenge that goal and shape it and tell us what it ought to be. So there's a certain way in which we can't just give a goal and have people respond to it. We need to, we need to give a goal, but then we need them to, to challenge it, articulate it, evolve it. And then we also need them to tell us uh, how they would go about it. And then we need to enable them to go about it. But I think you're, to your point, a learning culture invites challenge and uh, debate on the goals as well. Yeah. I'll stop there. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to, you know, what, what the two of you just said here just reminded me of something that, I, you know, I always tell the, the Cisco organization, the people I'm, I'm responsible for helping, and, you know, the most important thing that we can create, you know, take any topic in the world, there's no more important topic than learning how to learn, learning how to adapt, learning how to change. And so creating a learning culture is the most important asset that you have and creating people who are not afraid to fail. You know, one of the things that we've had to do in the technology industry is embrace that in spades. We've had to embrace this to a level of not only ex um, accepting failure, but expecting a certain amount of things will fail. And if we're not failing a certain amount of time, then we're not pushing hard enough, which means we will be disrupted and we will undergo dramatic change beyond our control. So for us, we really, um, you know, we look at it as, you know, we hope to be successful, you know, 70, 80% of the time, but if we're not unsuccessful and learning from that 20% of the time, then we're clearly not pushing hard enough. And having that top-down sort of agenda and mindset and being able to institute it in your organization, even in, in small parts of the organization, to get things going is really, really critical. Because you want to create a, a culture that says, let's try something. You know, you heard the term fail fast. Well, you, you, you obviously aren't trying to fail, but you want to learn fast. You want to learn what's going to work, what's not going to work. You want to prototype ideas, whether you know, regardless of whether it's a technology idea or a business idea or whatever, you want to prototype and try it fast. And everybody needs to merge to this agile approach to their organization and to the things that they need to learn and do and change every day. So I think the adaption, the ability to learn are probably the number one skill set everybody has to have for the future. There is a question in the audience. Can you just tell us your name and the organization that you're from? Uh, my name is Teddy Levine. I'm the Director of Education, the Chief Learning Officer of the Department of Veterans Affairs in the Bronx. And I just want to say that I just want to respond to some of the comments that were said, that all of us as learning leaders sitting here, we are responsible and are charged with the uh, responsibility to create learning organizations. The concept of a learning organization occurred uh, in, in early 1990s with Peter Senge, the fifth discipline, which is the Bible on learning organizations. And I just want to say when, when someone says that organizations are con contradictory and do not embrace innovation, they have no choice now. I think organizations right. know right. that in order to survive and compete they need to embrace innovation, and we need to become learning organizations. And everybody sitting in this room that has come to this particular seminar is aware of that. And that is our charge, and that is our challenge. And it's very challenging. And you don't become a learning organization. What you do is you evolve towards becoming a learning organization. So we ourselves, organizations, continue to learn and it's very difficult to actually uh, to create change and affect change and to actual cultural transformation takes a long time and it's constantly evolving. So I just had to respond to that as a learning leader in my organization because we are all passionate about that. And to say that organizations are, are you know, do not want innovation or creativity, we need to have that in order to excel, become excellent, in order to evolve. Thank you. Could I, could I make a comment in, in response? Sure. Yes, go ahead, Robert. I, I would characterize that as 
all hands on deck, which means if we're going to create a learning organization, nobody gets to opt out. <laughs> and what I've experienced uh, at Ketchum is that our CEO demonstrates he's willing to learn. Now, you know, CEO can't do it all by himself, but <clears throat> the fact that he's humble enough to say, I screwed up, I'm learning, and the fact that he participates actively in these learning activities and gives time and energy to them and encourages everybody in the organization to learn. So what I want to say is everybody, it's all hands on deck, like you're saying. If we're going to create a learning culture, nobody gets to hop out. We have to not only talk it, we have to uh, do it, walk the talk. Thanks.